shall rise up to pray. I'm waiting for those who are still sitting down to make up your mind and stand up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for our Bible study. Thank you, Lord, because every time we come before you, you always reveal your mind, your will, and eternal truth unto us. Therefore, Lord, we're asking that tonight you reveal your mind to us once again in Jesus' name. We're praying that these eternal truths that will lead us from us to heaven, you reveal very clearly and plainly to every one of us in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you bless all our brothers and sisters and all the other Bible study locations who are receiving by satellite. And those in this country, Lord, who be at various times, even though they are not able to get to the fellowship, then they use uh, their, their, their internet and they connect. Oh, Lord, I just pray your blessings will be showered upon everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Our hearts go out to all those in various countries. And Lord, we pray that in those countries, Anglophone countries, French-speaking countries, you bless them abundantly as you are blessing us here in Jesus' name. And our young people, cheer, Lord, near young age, you grant them the privilege of coming to listen to you so that you can channel their path. In the path of righteousness in their young age, we pray, Lord, all these wars will be fatal, will fall to fatal ground in their hearts in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that tonight you help us to really understand what you are sharing with us. And then we'll be able to stand up in the grace and the strength and the power of the Lord. We'll carry it out and be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. Bless everyone tonight, Lord. And then begin to use us as teachers of the word ourselves so that we go to other people and then declare the truth to them. And through that, more teachers will come to the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're back to the Sermon on the Mount. That means we're still in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And today we're looking at an important part of that sermon. Very important, very significant, because this could determine your eternal destiny. In Matthew chapter 6, we're looking at verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Here Jesus Christ was talking about uh, something he knew very well. He knew this from all eternity. He knew that God is the almighty. He knew that God is the great creator of the heavens and the earth. And he knew that God is the judge of the whole universe. He knew God as father. And he knew God that is the all in all, the alpha and the omega and the almighty. And he knew that if anyone was going to get any love, any commitment, any kind of consecration to the Lord, it has to be total and complete. And then you know that how, how God told Moses and he knew all that Jesus Christ knew the Old Testament and then he knew the, the intention, the principle, everything that the father was teaching the children of Israel when he said, you will love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Which means that the totality of the personality of man, everything you've got within and without around you, you bring everything to the altar of the Lord and you serve the Lord without reservation. You serve the Lord without looking back. You serve the Lord without any kind of interference or rivals. You serve the Lord with all your heart. So then Jesus brings this principle. He looks at God as Lord. The exalted one, the controller, the director of our lives, and the master. And then he looks at all the other things in life that are trying to compete with the kind of authority that God has upon our lives. God has divine ownership. 
by creation, he is our God, our Lord, our Master. And then by redemption, he is our Father, as well as the director of our lives, he is Master. Consider it any way and anyhow God is Lord and his Master. And then all these others that are trying to take the emphasis away from God. And then they want to get our heart, our affection, our attention, our love, our commitment, our consecration. They want to own our lives. And then God, Jesus said, it will never be possible for you to give your heart to God. God, I didn't give your heart to any other sin. That's why he said, no man can serve two masters. Then he said, for either he will hate the one or, and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And then he, br he brought it now very clearly, pointedly, as if he was pointing to each of them, ye or you cannot serve God and mammon. This is what we're looking at today. Undivided loyalty in serving God. Undivided loyalty in serving God. When Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, he was giving us something that he said is utterly impossible. That you will have two incompatible masters, two opposing masters, and two different masters, and yet be yielded and submissive and surrendered unto them. As light and darkness are different, so God and Satan are different. It will be impossible for you to be in the light and be in darkness at the same time. It will be impossible for you, therefore, to serve God. God and Satan at the same time as light and darkness are different so God and dead idols are different as far away as darkness is from the light so the dead idols are far away from the living God and so you cannot serve God and dead idols at the same time and God and the world are so different the world is dark and deadly but God is alive and he quickens he gives life they are the extreme opposites and therefore because God and the world they're different so very different in that same way then you cannot serve God and the world at the same time and then he tells us the God of this world Satan he wants to control he wants to control. And that's why it's called the God of this world. In fact, he came to Jesus Christ and said, All these things have been given unto me. If you will fall down and worship me, then I'll give them to you. And Satan was trying to test the conviction of Jesus Christ on this very fact. You cannot serve God and mammon. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan, because it is written, You will serve the Lord and God only will you serve. Because it's impossible. An utter impossibility to serve God and the God of this world. And Satan, we have a choice to make. If we're going to truly serve the Lord, because no man can serve the two masters together. To serve God is to give a heart to him. He says, my son, give me your heart. It's not just asking for your head. It's not just asking for your hands. It's not just asking for your legs. It's not just asking for your property. It says your very heart, the very center of your being. It says, my son, give me your heart. And if we're going to really serve God acceptably, we must give him our heart. And we must love him supremely. Love him above everything in life, above everyone in life. So then we allow him to reign over us and to rule over all our decisions, over all our actions. We cannot serve God and at the same time give our heart, our interest, our devotion to an object that is incompatible with the almighty God. Serving God as master demands that we reject the lordship of Satan. You want to serve God as master? You want to serve him as the lord, the controller, the, contr the director of your life? It means that you reject every other thing that is trying to take away your interest, your life, and your attention away from the lord. It means that you reject totally 
the lordship of Satan. And then you reject the lordship of all the gods. And that's why the children of Israel said in Isaiah chapter 26 and in verse 13. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 13. O Lord our God, all the lords beside thee have had dominion over us. And they regretted the time they submitted themselves to all the lords. And they regretted the time they just yielded their devotion, their dedication, their consecration, their mind unto all the lords. And, and now they confessed before the Lord and said, Lord, O Lord our God, all the lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only. This is a new conviction and this is a new decision. And this is a new confession. We're telling you now, Lord, we're forgetting the past and coming away out of the past. It's, they said, but now, but by thee only, we will make mention of thy name. And that's what the Lord is calling us to, that whatever you've done in the past, whatever you've yielded to in the past, whatever you have surrendered to in the past, that now you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, now I know. That no man can serve two masters. And because I cannot serve God and mammon, I quit yielding myself, surrendering myself unto Satan, unto the world, unto dead idols. And I come to submit myself fully, wholeheartedly, completely unto the Almighty God. That's what he determined, that's what he demands. He wants us to love him so that you hate every other competitor. That will take your heart away from him. Holding on to him. Making you to despise the world and the flesh. That means knowing the utter impossibility of serving God and mammon. You make an irreversible covenant. An irreversible covenant with God to serve him. Serve him only. Serve him always. And serve him ever. Mark those words, irreversible covenant. Irreversible covenant that you make with the Lord that here is the one you are going to serve. And this is an irreversible perpetual covenant. Look at Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50. We're looking at verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 5. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces see the word, saying, come. And let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Let us join ourselves unto the Lord in a perpetual covenant that will not be reversed, that will not be changed, that will not be forgotten. That's what the Lord is calling us to do. That's what the Lord is expecting that we're going to do as we yield ourselves and surrender ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant, in an irreversible covenant. In Matthew chapter 6, once again, the text of today, the text says, no man. And no man means no matter how wise. No man, no matter how clever. No man, no matter how enlightened and educated. Can serve two masters. No man, whatever your spiritual experience may be. No man can serve Two masters, you cannot pretend to do it. God knows you cannot do it. Heaven knows you cannot do it. Christ knows you cannot do it. That no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. He say you cannot love both masters equally. At the same time, you hate one and you love the other. And then it says, or else it will hold to the one, embrace the one, and cling to the one, and cleave to the one, and leave the other, and despise the other. And then it brings a conclusion. It said, you cannot serve two masters. As we look at this study tonight, we'll divide the story to three parts. Number one, the impossibility of serving God 
and mammon. Just impossible. Just impossible. And therefore, there's no use trying. It's impossible. The impossibility of serving God and mammon. Number two, the implication of serving God as master. What does that mean? To serve God as master. Own him as master. Love him as master. Yield to him as master. Embrace him as master. Cleave unto the Lord as master. The implication of that. The implication of serving God as master. Point number three now is uh, telling us the impiety, the iniquity, the sinfulness, the impiety of serving God and mammon. We come to number one, the impossibility of serving God and mammon. We come to this, Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. By the time we finish the study, we have repeated, repeated this verse. A number of times that you should know it in your heart and it should be a guiding principle in your life. Anytime that the God of this world will try to come to put some pressure on you, you remember this in your mind because it's written upon the tables of your heart. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And let's look at a parallel passage. Parallel passage means another passage of scripture. Where Jesus said the same thing. And that scene is recorded in Luke chapter 16, verse 13. Luke Chapter 16, and we're reading from verse 13. The words of Jesus, no servant can serve two masters. The same thing. No man can serve two masters. No slave can serve two masters. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else it will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. That same thing right there. This declaration of Christ is true at all times. And in all ages. You know there are some people that will read something in the Bible. And they will say well that's for the past. This is a modern time. This is a new day. And what, uh, you know, people did in days gone by, uh, you cannot expect that we're doing the same thing today. This is an eternal principle that you cannot serve two masters. Whether you are in Genesis or in Joshua, whether you are in Jeremiah or Daniel, whether you are in Malachi or Matthew, whether you are in Revelation or you are in the present day, any time, Anywhere in Africa or Asia, in America or in Europe, no man can serve two masters. Anywhere you are, any person you may be, any religion you may profess, any kind of gift you may have, no man at any time, anywhere, is an eternal principle. No man can serve two masters, whether you are married or you are not married. Whether you are young or you are old, a man or a woman. This is a principle that cuts across the human nature. In fact, we say this is a law of human nature. A servant cannot serve two masters at the same time. His affection, his loyalty, his obedience will be divided. And he will fail altogether in his duty to the one and to the other. Impossible to serve two masters. No one can serve the true God and at the same time be supremely engaged in loving the world and serving any selfish interests. Think about that. If you have any selfish interest, personal interest, private agenda, and you are committed to that, you are not serving God. You cannot serve 
God and your private agenda at the same time. Well, you may pretend you think you're, you think you're serving God like Absalom pretended, you remember? Absalom will come and then he will bow down to the father because David was king and David was his father. But you know, it was all superficial, hypocritical. It was all pretense. He had his private agenda, his personal ambition, his selfish interest. And because of that selfish interest, all those things he did, all those things, those are just hypocritical, superficial things. And then when the people came and they bowed to him, you know, this kind of plastic. Uh, Humility, this kind of put on him. Oh, get up. I'm just a man like you are. If your case had been handed over to me, I would have handled it. It's all hypocrisy, all that bowing down, all that, uh, you know, yes, sir, yes, sir. There's a private agenda. And because you're committed to that private agenda, you cannot be committed to the Lord. No man can serve two masters. No one can serve the true God and at the same time be supremely engaged to loving the world or serving any selfish interest. Our devotion to the world and the things of the world will interfere with our commitment to the Lord. That's why it says you cannot serve two masters. Let's look at Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. We're reading from verse 14. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity. Notice that, serve the Lord in sincerity. His sincerity spoils your service. You may sacrifice. You may consecrate. You may deny yourself. You may go through some tough times. You may face great challenges. All those challenges are nothing. The self-denial is nothing. If you give your body to be born, it's nothing. If there is no sincerity in your heart, it spoils everything. That's why the word of God is telling us, you serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth. If you are not holding on to the truth and believing the truth and practicing the truth in private and in public, all your public service is in vain. God doesn't, God doesn't worry about those things. He's, he's not accepting them because no man can serve two masters. If you're going to serve the Lord, your heart must be clear and open. Your life must be transparent and you serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth. Then he says, put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. That's what it takes in verse 15. And if it seem able to, unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. You know what he said? He said, you cannot hold on to God and hold on to an idol at the same time. Therefore, if it seems evil. For you to serve the Lord in sincerity and truth, then choose whom you want to serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. For, but as for me, wonderful to have a decision. Wonderful to have a mind of your own. Wonderful to know that you are not following the crowd. That even if the whole nation goes the way they want you go, but you say, as for me, and my house. Oh, thank God. Joshua could speak for himself and for his house. Not everybody can do that. Not every father can say, as for me and my house, you know, you have some fathers. I about your children. Well, he says, I don't know. I don't know what their decisions are. I can only talk about myself. Not everybody can talk like Joshua. And then you have some mothers. How about your children? Are you sure of them? That the same God you serve and the same God you worship with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind is the same God your children are serving. And then the mother will look up. I cannot tell. I cannot tell. I only know about myself. Thank God to have a person like Joshua. A person like Joshua that said, it's not only me. As for me 
and my house we will serve the lord in fact there are some parents that don't care whether their children serve the lord or not there are some husbands that don't care whether their wives serve the lord or not there are some wives that don't care whether their husbands serve the lord or not there are even some pastors that don't care whether they are the members of their church serve the lord in all sincerity or not they say well the congregation is there they'll make a decision for themselves they don't want to help their congregation their church the local church that was all their heart all their soul all their mind was all the commitment conviction in them they'll serve the lord they say well they can they, they have their minds to take a decision but they say i only know about myself not joshua joshua said as for me and my house we will serve the lord and the people answered and said god forbid that we should forsake the lord and serve other gods for the lord our god he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of egypt from the uh, from the house of bondage which did great those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went among all the people through whom we passed the lord drove out from before us all the people even the Amorites which dwelt in the land and therefore we will serve the Lord for he is our Lord we will serve the Lord for he is our Lord look at what Joshua said in verse 19 and Joshua said unto the people ye cannot serve the Lord ye cannot serve the lord it's more than just saying it with your mouth it's more than coming to church it's more than carrying the bible it's more than just making a confession it's more than repeating it after the evangelist it's more than saying it because the pastor is preaching it he said you cannot serve the lord because i know you you're superstitious you're syncretic you want to have God on the one hand and have your own self, your own purpose, your own plan, your own goal, your own selfish interest, pride. On the other hand, you cannot serve the Lord. It's good to have people like Joshua that can tell us face to face and I can challenge us and make us re-examine our decision to serve the Lord he said no in verse 19 ye cannot serve the Lord for he is an holy God he is a jealous God he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins he said now you know the truth if you deliberately go into worshiping idol he'll deal with you thank god for people like joshua and then the people now made up their minds they didn't say okay joshua since you said we cannot serve the lord all right we cannot serve the lord and that's going to determine your eternal destiny if you just give it up like that and say well since you say we cannot do it and you're not finding out how do i do it acceptably determines your eternal destiny so they said in verse 20 uh, it says if he forsake the lord and serve strange gods then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that after that he had done you good thank you joshua joshua you know did not believe that thing they call eternal unconditional security once saved always saved I raised up my hand in a crusade and then I repeated after the evangelist, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I've had your word, I've had your word. I know I'm a sinner, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died for me on the cross, I know you died for me on the cross. I come to you today, I come to you today. I give my life to you, I give my life to you. Now save me, now save me. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. And because you raised up your hand in the crusade, then you go back worshiping idol, and somebody tells you, once saved, always saved, it's a lie. And so Joshua said, look at that verse 20 again. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you 
after that he had done you good and the people said unto Joshua nay but we will serve the Lord we will serve the Lord and they made up their minds and they said we know what you are talking about and we know we cannot mix this the service of the living God and the service of strange gods we know what you mean total commitment, total abandonment unto the Lord because he is the divine owner, the creator and the redeemer and because of who he is we yield our hearts and mind, everything we've got to the Lord and we're not going to have any commitment to any strange God, any idol, we will serve the Lord you see when your heart becomes divided then you are faulty before the Lord, Hosea chapter 10 verses 1 and 2 Hosea chapter 10 reading verses 1 and 2 Israel is an empty vine he bringeth forth fruit unto himself think about that Israel is an empty vine he bringeth forth fruit unto himself do you understand that when you win converts you know the Pharisees, they went all about trying to win converts. You know what they did? They want the converts into their synagogue. And they made those converts twofold children of hell than themselves. And you know there are people that just win converts to themselves. And there are some people that say they are witness. And they witness to ladies, they are men. And then after they witness to them, those people say, yes, I believe in the Lord. They are looking for wife. And then eventually it says, you know, as I brought you to the Lord and now you are my convert. It looks like something is telling me. That's the devil telling you though. Something is telling me you are now my wife. They bring forth fruit unto themselves and they are not bringing the fruit unto the Lord they are not serving God with a kind of total heart total commitment unto the Lord but it is to bring forth fruit unto themselves therefore they become an empty vine and it says according to the multitude of his fruit as he increased the altars according to the goodness of his land they have made goodly images their heart is divided their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. When in your service, in your devotion, in your work for the Lord, the glory of God alone is not your intention. The exaltation of the Lord is not your motive. Pleasing the Lord is not the only objective you have. But you have another personal interest, another private agenda. Your heart is divided and you'll be found faulty. You're like the double-minded man James is talking about in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Once you are double-minded, you want to go this way and go that way. You want to serve God and still have your gain. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Your mind is not focused. Your heart is not centered on the Lord alone. And your worship is not to the almighty God alone. You're looking for the praise of men. You're looking for recognition. You're looking for some exaltation. You're looking for some material gain. You're a double-minded man. And if you give that service to the Lord and there's no recognition and there's no praise of man, you get angry. And hey, the next service you are going to give and the next thing you are going to render to the Lord is going to be substandard because there's something in your heart. You're not rendering that service only unto the Lord, going up to the Lord as a sweet savor because you are involved in it and self pollutes your service. Self destroys the reality. The genuineness of your service. 
It's like while you're serving, your mind is thinking of another thing. And if you don't have that other thing you are thinking about, then you're not, you're not trying to service to the Lord. You may want to examine your salvation. You may want to examine the condition of your heart. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. In your service of the Lord, if that service is going to be accepted, in your prayer, in your praying, whatever, whatever the prayer, it's not just the words. What's inside you? Are you looking for something else? Selfish interest? Ambition? Are you trying to impress somebody? Are you trying to attack somebody while you are praying? So that the prayer is not just ascending to God. I hope so and so is hearing the prayer. I hope so and so is watching the prayer. I hope so and so is taking note. Uh -huh. The prayer is not just to God. There's another ambition. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Are you saved? Are you a child of God? Do you have a heart centered and focused on wanting to serve God and God alone? Or is there another ambition? And that ambition is actually higher in your heart, in your life, than the desire to really serve the Lord in all sincerity. That's very important. That's why Samuel was telling the people and he said, if you are really going to serve the Lord, serve the Lord only. Notice that word, only. For Samuel chapter 7 verse 3. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, we're looking at verse 3. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts. If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts. Uh, will you please look up for a moment? And you know, sometimes uh, we have to have interest in people. Somebody has been in the church before, has been in the Lord before, and the fellow went away. And then eventually now the fellow maybe comes across the pastor. What do you think I'm going to do? Oh, I'm going to say, where, how are you? Where have you gone? Why are you just, what's your problem now? Oh, this is my, this is my problem. You know, if you come back to the Lord, he doesn't understand. He thinks I'm saying, if you come back to the church, I say, if you come back to the Lord, these are small things. The Lord will settle this. The Lord will help you. The Lord will provide for your need. Now the fellow, the interpretation that he has is that if I come back to the church, whatever financial problem I have, the church will give me all the money I need. And therefore the fellow will try and come back to the church, not to the Lord. And then see, you know, where the pastor can see him or her every time. And then one of these days they'll come and say, Pastor, you know, after that time you counseled me, I came back. What do you mean you came back? Did you come back to the Lord? Did you repent? Have you made restitution? And is there righteousness? Are you intending to get to heaven? Or is it that you came to the church so that now we'll know that you have come to the church and whatever material things you need, we'll be able to dip our hands in the pocket and give you. That's a selfish interest. That's not serving God. And when you come and the thing you're expecting does not come out, and then we don't give you anything, you say, I thought if I came back, they will all rally around and give me everything I want. That's an ambition. That's a desire. That's not serving God. If you're going to serve God, serve God because of heaven. And serve God because you know that Jesus went through the agony on the cross of Calvary. And he died for you. And because he died for you, your heart, your soul, your mind, everything you've got, you give yourself to the Lord. That's serving God. Not only that. You know, there are times when we move some of our pastors around. Listen to me. 
And sometimes we have a need in this hall. And so we move one of our pastors out of this hall. And then we move him to this hall. I mean to this stage. From this stage. And this other fellow there had been coming to the church. And you know very zealous. Because there is a personal relationship. I don't mean anything bad. I don't mean anything sinful. A personal love, relationship, affection, interaction between him, between her, and the pastor. And when the pastor is transferred and is moved to this other place, then he comes to a worship service the following Sunday. Our state overseer is not here. Our pastor is not here. What happened? Ah, if it's like this, I don't think I can stay. I don't think another pastor can take care of me like him. You are not serving God. You are coming because of the money. Because of the gifts. Because of what that state overseer pastor was giving you. You are not serving God. Now that he is transferred to another place. We don't see you in church again. You are not a child of God. If you are going to serve the Lord. All your heart. All your soul. All your mind. If Peter is there, I'm in church. If John is there, I'm in church. If Paul, the apostle, comes, I'm not, I'm not a disciple of Paul or a disciple of Peter or John. I'm a disciple of Christ. And all these are the servants of Christ. Whoever Christ sends, I'm there. That's serving the Lord. But you know all these people that are coming to church nowadays... And he really don't have a heart. He's serving the Lord. It's just because of this social interaction. Interpersonal relationship. That's not serving God. For Samuel chapter 7 verse 3. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel saying. If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts. Then put away the strange gods. And Astaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only and serve him only and serve him only. That's what the Lord requires because you cannot serve God and mammon. Let's come back now to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon actually refers to money, riches, wealth. Money, riches, wealth. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You know the promise of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then he said, then he will add all these things shall be what? Tell me out loud. Added unto you. We have a problem. We're serving God. We had nothing. No land. No house. No money in the bank. No car. Not even a second hand jalopy. Nothing. But he just said, I'm going to serve the Lord. I, I've got a call. And my call is to serve the Lord. And the Lord saw your sincerity. You were not looking for money. You came to the church. And you say, I just want to serve the Lord. What do you want to do? Well, this is my qualification. This is my experience. And this is what I've been doing. But anywhere you put me, I just want to serve the Lord. Seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then as, you know, the church then led by the Lord. It's not going to come from heaven. And you're not going to hear an audible voice. He has a servant that you have put there. And then a servant puts you here. And then you're just cheerful, happy 
with all your heart, all your soul, just serving the Lord. And then we'll give you a moderate amount can be, that can barely pay your house rent, that can barely pay any other thing after you've done the regular routine spending expenses. And then after that, the Lord begins to just bring this and that. Now you have land. Now you are trying to build a house. Now you are trying to have a car to yourself. And then you say, isn't the Lord wonderful? That's the addition he spoke about. The unfortunate thing is... Your mind now transfers the love, the affection to the added sin. That now you are not serving God only. You are now watching the money. The increase in salary. And you are watching the building that you are raising up. And you are watching the property. Now you are comparing yourself with other workers in the church. They gave him this, and this is what they gave me. Your service is now affected. Now mammon is now taking your heart. Remember, when you came in, that was not in your heart. And the Lord is saying, preserve that pure service unto the Lord. Once the grumbling comes... And once the murmuring comes, once you begin to throw stones at the pastor, because salary, look at me and look at what I've got. You're no more serving the Lord. There is an Absalom spirit in your heart right now. And it's like, I'm not just happy serving the Lord alone. What am I going to get? That serving God and mammon, it's impossible. And God is, has removed the sand away from your life. It won't take time. You're likely to leave. Leave the service of the Lord. But you're going to regret in eternity. And the Lord Jesus said, no man can serve God and mammon. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And he said, you in particular, you cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon, I told you, that's money, wealth, riches. And because of man's tendency to love and to trust in riches, it was eventually considered as an idol, a substitute for the true God. How dangerous it is to set your heart upon riches, seeing how easy it is for men to make each a God. In fact, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Look at that passage. That's First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. As I read this passage, I want you to uh, try to measure your Christian life with these verses. Measure your state of mind. With these verses, but godliness and contentment is great gain. Are you contented? Or is there this ambition that overrules your life? And every conversation, every thought, every discussion is showing your discontent, dissatisfaction. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out measure your life with that do you ever think about that on the final day when you're leaving this world and they make that casket coffin they're going to bury your bank account with you but say it having food and raiment having food and raiment you have more than food and raiment Having food and remage. Let us be there with content. Think about that. That's what sets you free. 
to serve the Lord without any destruction. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and not for lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves. Not the church. You cannot pierce the church with many sorrows, just yourself. You're not piercing your leaders with many sorrows, just yourself. They have pierced themselves with many sorrows, I pray God will deliver us. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. We come to point number two. Point number two, the implication of serving God as master. Let's come to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6. We're looking at verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. I want you to look at the Verbs that are used there. Serve. you find that in the first sentence in verse 24. Hate. Love. Hold to. Despise. And then serve. As we look at those verbs, we see what it takes and what it means to serve the Lord from the text we learn. What it means to serve God as master. Because the Lord Jesus himself uses the word serve, love, hold to. To serve God is to love him. Number one. Number two is to hold to him. That word hold, another scriptural word is cleave. To cleave unto the Lord. To serve God is to love him. Not in words only but in deed and in truth. He who serves God truly and acceptably must serve him wholeheartedly. God will not permit a rival to share the throne of our heart with him. If our love, if our hearts are divided, he will say, like he told the children of Israel, they have not followed me fully. As we look at the text, to serve God is to hold unto God. That means to cleave unto him. That is to cleave unto him in a perpetual, everlasting, unforgettable, irreversible covenant. In all conditions of life, in all situations of life. It is to hold to him and his commandments. Even when those commandments are not pleasing to the flesh. Even when we go through some inconveniences. Still to hold on to the Lord. It is to give God the first place in our affection, in our devotion. Presenting our hearts to him and preserving our hearts for him. As a sacred ground on which neither mammon nor the world nor Satan nor anyone is allowed to intrude or to trespass. God wants us to serve him as master and to be the Lord. For him to be the Lord of all our lives. In Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. Master. That's who God is. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. His son honoreth his father. And his servant is master. If then I be a father. Where is mine honor? And if I be a master. Where is my fear? He wants us to fear him. Honor him. Reverence him. Bow before him, bend the knee before him, bend our hearts to his will. That's when we accept him as master. Deuteronomy chapter 10. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, reading from verse 12. 10 verse 12. That's what it means to serve God. 
And now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God? God and to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve him. Walk in all his ways, fear him, serve him. What does that mean? To fear him. To fear him. I thought we were not to fear God. Of course, we were to fear him. What does that mean? What it means is anything you're doing, any conversation you're having, any discussion you're holding on to, any communication you're having, picture it as if God is physically there. We know he's spiritually there. We know God is everywhere. But picture him as if God were there personally, physically. Let me use another illustration. Let's say, for example, you are a man. And the devil is trying to tempt your body towards another woman, married or not married. If she's married, think about her husband being by her side. And then the devil is bringing this temptation to your body. And the husband is by the side of the woman. What are you going to do? You have the fear of that husband. And you'll not make a fool of yourself because you know you know, life can be difficult for you. If you try to do anything in the presence of the husband, if it's a lady that doesn't have husband but has a father, think about you having that temptation. And the father is by the side of that lady. That lady herself will not want to do anything like that. Immorality, fornication, while the father is looking on. And you will not want to touch her while the father is looking on. That's what it means. That you have a fear of God. That whatever you are going to do, your picture that God is there. He's looking at everything. He's hearing every conversation. And he's look, he knows the motive. He knows the action. Because of that fear of God. You'll not want to do evil. That's what it means to serve the Lord. You serve him and you fear him. You love him. You honor him. You respect him. Every word of your mouth. Every action of your life is being supervised by the almighty God. And because of that immediate supervision, you don't want to do anything that is evil. That's serving God. That's loving God. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 20. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God. And that thou mayest obey his voice. And that thou mayest cleave unto him. You see that? Hold to him. Cleave to him. So that there will never be a separation between you and the almighty God. Joshua chapter 22 verse 5. But take diligent heed. To do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him. Keep all his commandments, cleave unto him. That's serving God. Then it says to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Let's come to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, you know when we say, to, when the Bible says to love God, to serve him, to fear him. Uh, there are some unskilled people, unskilled in the scripture. Oh, they all say that's Old Testament, Old Testament. Fearing God, Old Testament. Old Testament. And they don't understand that even in the New Testament, Jesus Christ himself, the giver of grace. Jesus Christ himself, the shepherd of love. He speaks about fearing God. He said, I'll show you, I'll tell you, whom you will fear. Fear God. Because after killing the body, it can drive and draw the soul into hell. Then it says, I say unto you, fear him. 
Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. New Testament. New Testament. Serve him with reverence and with godly fear. We come to point number three. The impiety. The iniquity. The sinfulness of serving God and mammon. We come back to Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew, sorry, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. In a broad sense, mammon is whatsoever seeks to compete with God in our lives. Riches, the world, or whoever wants to displace God in our lives. Whoever wants to displace God in our lives. Whoever, that's a person, that's a human being. That wants to displace God in our lives. What does that mean? You know, it's good to love one another. The Bible tells us everywhere, love one another, love one another. But you know, the love of God has to be above, beyond the love to any man, any woman. Husbands, love your wives. Of course, husbands must love their wives and the wife must love the husband. But the love of God must go way beyond the love of wife, the love of husband in our hearts. And that's the love that he demands. If you're going to serve the Lord acceptably. But you know there are times that people will carry the love of a fellow brother too far beyond its limitation. And he'll carry the love of the husband and the love of the wife far beyond its limitation. And they carry the love of a son. The love of a daughter. More than they carry far beyond its limitation. But you need to understand if you're going to serve God acceptably, you love God more than your wife. Much, much, much more than your wife. If your wife said, My dear honey, you know this church we're going. I'm getting kind of dissatisfied. I think I need this and this and this. And I'm mean, trying to find a way to tell you. I don't want us to go to that church anymore. What's your problem? I just don't like the way things are now in that place anymore. And she sits at home on Sunday. Doesn't want to come to church. And then you say this, my wife. And you love her. We, te we taught you to love your wife. The Bible taught you to love your wife. But to love God more than your wife. And there are some people that will say, Well, if my wife wants to change church, I don't have an alternative. I don't agree with that. But I, I don't want to see her unhappy. I don't, I don't ever want to see tears in her eyes. Oh, she better weeps. And if she decides not to come, you say, on this point, we disagree. I gave my life to the Lord there. And the teaching of the word of God, I cannot get it any other place but that place. I'm going to stay there. And if she decides she's not coming, 
That's a decision. You love God above your wife. That's serving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And if it's your husband, he's got a new job. He's got a new car. He's got all these uh, things of the world that will vanish away. And now that has gotten into his head, has got you into his heart, has taken his affection away from the Lord. And he's saying that, you know, my mates, my colleagues, my equals are no more there. I don't think I can go and sit with those people anymore. And then I don't want you to go to that church anymore. You are the wife. And she is telling you, you, you know, uh, my wife, the uh, way I'm working now for you to match me. This is what you do. You say, but that is against the word of God. Look at our conviction. All these years. Oh, you say, no, don't worry about that. Uh, you love me, don't you? Yes, I love you. But I love God more than I love you. That is serving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And it is when you understand that. And sometimes it's your children. We love our children. We ought to love our children. What if any of your children will say, Daddy, we, just, we don't like to break your heart. Mommy, we don't like to break your heart. But we don't uh, want to continue in that church. Again, which church? <laughs> that's why I gave birth to you. And that's what I've been teaching you. Since you were born, you don't want it anymore. If you don't want the church, you don't want me. If you don't want the God of the Bible and the God that I serve, you don't want me. I know you mothers, you love your children so much that, you know, it can all, it's almost you say, let me die. If my child is going to leave me, don't die. Just tell that child, I'll show you the way of the Lord. If you don't follow it, you are going to suffer. And if they go, let them go, but stay. It's not good for mommy and children to go to hell. If we cannot get everybody to heaven, at least let mommy get to heaven. Let daddy get to heaven. You love the Lord more than your children, more than your parents, more than everybody. You make up your mind. This is what it means to serve the Lord. That's what Jesus taught, by the way. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother, more than me, is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter, more than me, is not worthy of me. If your child just, you know, decides, he doesn't want to serve the Lord, you will still serve the Lord. I know some of those children are thinking, they don't understand the Bible. And they are thinking, if I don't go to church anymore, then they will stop my father, they will stop my mother from preaching. You are mistaken. We are not going to stop your daddy and your mommy. Once you are of age, if you are still a toddler, if you are still an infant, if you are still a little child, and your parents are not able to control you, say, why are you not able to control this little child? But when you become of age, and you get to the point your father, your daddy, your mommy cannot beat you anymore, and you know, you're almost taller than mommy, almost taller than daddy. And there's nothing you can do anymore. You bolt out, you will carry your own responsibility. And your daddy will keep on serving the Lord if he wants to serve the Lord. The father must love God more than the children. The mother must love God more than the children. That's what Jesus said. And then he says in Luke, Chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 26. If any man come, at, come, come unto me and hate not father. That means to, to love them much, much less. Less than God. And hate not father and mother and wife. Hey, your wives, I hope you understand the scriptures. Don't ever think. My husband now is a leader. And if I decide I'm going to get worldly and I'm going to forsake the Lord, once they see that me, the wife, I'm not pulling my weight anymore, they will stop my husband. You are mistaken. Not today. 
if that is your method, that is your goal, I'm going to, you know, make my husband not to be a preacher, make my husband not to be an overseer. And I know if I go to do this, then my husband will not be a minister again. If that is your motive, we'll detect it, we'll find out. And we're not going to stop your husband. If you want to go to hell, you go alone. We're not going to tell your husband to follow you to hell. We're going to hold on to your husband. And we're going to be encouraging him to stand in spite of what may happen in the family. We must look at the old scriptures together. And so don't you think you can pull another person away from the ministry, from the service of the Lord. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You make up your mind, you want to serve the Lord. You will serve the Lord. I said you will serve the Lord. You know this is what it means. It just means to make up your mind. And to say come what may. Rain or sunshine. I will follow the Lord. Will you follow the Lord? It just means to dedicate yourself. And to sacrifice everything. And to say I've made up my mind. I've made, up, I've made my choice. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not going to try to join God and mammon together. My life, my heart, everything I have belongs to the Lord. And the Lord is telling us that, you know, with all your heart, you just serve the Lord without looking back. In Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 20, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my, my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much good goods laid up for many years. Take then ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. You see, those are people that concentrate only on material things, material gain, asle things, tangible things. Sand, mud, cement, stone, wood, slates, building. That's all they know. Serving God with all their heart. All their soul, all their they don't know. All they know is gold, silver, money, currency. That's all. Plan. Even messages. The messages they're interested in. The messages that show, that motivate. How you can get this and get this. Not how you can get to heaven. And then these fellows said, I'll build greater. And then I will say to my soul, you have many years now. Take thine ease. And then eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Thou fool. Have you ever thought about that? You think a fool is somebody who is an illiterate? No. Some illiterates are wise. When you make a decision for eternity, you are wise. When you think of where you'll spend eternity, though you're an illiterate, you're wise. If you have many degrees, and then you are not thinking about eternity, you're a fool. God said so, not me. The Lord Jesus said, we should not say thou fool, but you cannot limit God. He knows who the fools are. And God said unto him, thou fool. With your many lands, thou fool. With your bulging bank account, thou fool. With all your degrees, thou fool. With all the things you have on earth, the position, the, the possession, thou fool. And with all the friends that come to you, and with all the parties you throw, and with all the monies you have sufficient and to spare, thou fool. The one that doesn't plan for eternity. What a fool. 
The one that doesn't plan for how he will get to heaven, what a fool. And the one that doesn't understand that we need to have salvation, except him and be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, what a fool. The one that has all his time, all his thoughts, all his ambition, all his desires, is spent on amassing wealth, and when he dies, they're not going to bury those things with him, what a fool. The one that is busy making friends, and is not making friends with the almighty God, what a fool. The one that is trying to make the people make the ass better in politics but is not creating a place for himself in heaven he doesn't have a mansion in heaven what a fool he is and God said thou fool and for you coming to the Bible study coming every time studying from Genesis to Revelation and there's no salvation what a fool you are and the one that is trying you come to church all the messages listen about faith on healing faith on prosperity and faith to have this all your prayer, how to get married, how to have children, and you don't have salvation, the holiness with, without which no man shall see the Lord what a fool you are, and the Lord is saying if you give your heart and your mind and your soul, and you give to the things of this world, and but you are not ready for heaven, it says what a fool you are, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, and whose shall those things be which thou hast provided, so is he that lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Is not rich towards God. Haggai, I'm reading from chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. Here the Lord was calling the people, calling them to wisdom. So that they will not be a fool until they die. He was calling them so that they will not live a life. A life that, that now will prepare for eternity. Agai chapter 1 verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts. Saying. These people say the time is not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord to Haggai. The prophet saying, Is it time for you ye to dwell in your sealed houses? And this house lie waste? He said, you are taking care of yourself. You are not taking care of me. You are taking care of your houses. You are not taking care of the house of God. You are trying to serve yourself and you are not serving me. You have an ambition, a selfish interest. And your mind is not focused on God. That's what, why he called them to question. And then he said in verse 5, Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Think about your ways. In verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Put me first. Serve God. Don't just concentrate all your time, all your energy on yourself. Consider your ways. In verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. We will obey the voice of the Lord. I said we'll obey the voice of the Lord. And we turn away from all this personal ambition. Selfish ambition. Me, me, me. All the time. And then we turn our hearts toward the almighty God. And we serve God without looking back. And then let's go to chapter 2 of Haggai. In chapter 2 verse 4. Chapter 2 verse 4 says. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josedek the high priest and be strong all ye people of the land says the Lord and work be strong all ye people of the land and work that's the work to do maybe you'll be selfish and thinking about the work of you know doing this and doing this and doing this to get money for yourself God has a work to do think about God and serve the Lord with all your heart all your soul all your mind I don't think about you. I have to do this. I have to do this. If you have food and raiment, be content therewith. And then the work of the Lord is there now and work. You know, I've been hearing the announcements that, you know, our leaders have been making. They made it yesterday on Sunday. I made it today again. Workers retreat. Workers retreat. Now it's weekend. And work. Work for the Lord. But you know, there are people that, even though it's now weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but you know, they're still here and there. And you're wondering, they say they are saved. They say they are sanctified. They say they are filled with the Holy Ghost. They say they are workers. 
And when it comes to just giving a few hours, just a few days, to come and prepare yourself, if it's a seminar that will give you a kind of professional upliftment, you always go there. You write to me and take permission. I'm going here, I'm going there. When it comes to the work of the Lord, do you come? And work in verse 4. And then it says, for I am with you, the Lord will be with us. I said the Lord will be with us. When you serve God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and you abandon all these selfish interests, and then you just serve God alone without mammon. And then it goes on, it says, uh, look at this uh, verse now, in verse, um, this verse 18, verse 18. Consider now from this day. Those people, they obey the Lord. It's wonderful to obey the Lord. I said it's wonderful to obey the Lord. We are going to obey. How many of us will obey the Lord? Praise the Lord. God bless your life. Verse 18, consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month. Ninth month. What month are we in? What day are we in? 24. From this day. 24 day of the ninth month such a study coming to us that is drawing us and saying i want your heart i want your life i want your time i want your talent on the 24th day of this ninth month this day that if we will do like they did on such a day for them and the same day comes to us and the Lord is saying exalt my name exalt my work and turn around and all the selfish ambition abandon them from this day that the foundation of the temple is let consider it is there is the seed yet in the band yea as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree has not has not brought forth from this day will I bless you blessing is coming if we will just say now we have seen our error now we have discovered our fault now we have seen our wrongdoing the Lord wants all my heart all my soul and all my mind and this very day 24th of September I come to give it to the Lord I'm telling you the blessings God will pour upon your life there will be, not, there will be no room enough to receive it why don't you rise up and tell the Lord from this day I give myself, I commit myself, I consecrate myself, I yield myself completely. I'm not going to serve God and mammon, I'm going to serve him with all my heart, all my soul and all my mind. I'm going to give myself unreservedly unto the Lord. And the Lord is saying from this day I'm going to bless you. Praying is sincerity. No more hypocrisy. No more selfish ambition. No more pretense. No more personal agenda. No more murmuring or complaining. No more trying to serve God and mammon. But with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, wanting to serve the Lord. Loving God above mother or father. Loving God above son or daughter. Loving God above wife or husband. Loving God above yourself. Loving God above any property on earth. Loving God above salary. Loving God above anything. But loving God all your soul, all your mind, all your heart. Not serving God and mammon. But serving God truthfully. Serving God wholeheartedly. Serving God unreservedly. Serving God with real absolute surrender. Entire consecration unto the Lord. Serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. With all your heart. With all your soul. With all your mind. To serve the Lord.
your motive matters in everything you do your intention matters in everything you do your goal your purpose your mind it matters in everything you do not just the words in your prayer your very heart your very life your intention you don't want to be like an Absalom, bending down, bowing down, kind of pretended humility. But the heart was devilish, murderous, wanting to even kill the father. Was so position drunk, power drunk, could hurt the father and do anything. Just because of having the position, you don't want to be like that. That's not serving God. Serving God because of money. Serving God because they are smiling at me. They love me. They appreciate me. They respect me. They honor me. They exalt me. They're promoting me. So I will serve the Lord. That's not serving God. If that's your reason. What if those things were not there? What if you are rebuked? What if you are corrected? What if you are not praised? What if you are not appreciated? You still serve God. What if you have personal, private, domestic, family problem? Will you still serve God? But to give your heart to the Lord and to serve Him and to cleave unto Him and to embrace Him and to surrender unto Him and to yield unto him. Even if the local church is not able to give you money. They are not able to give you charity. To still serve God. Even if the person you said I want to marry. Is saying no. To still serve God. And even if children are not available yet, to still serve God. Loving God above children. I don't have any child yet. How can I serve God? Of course you can serve God. Don't have any wife yet. Can I serve God? Of course. I've not got an husband yet. Can I serve God? Of course. No job. Can I serve God? Why not? I'm despised, I'm ridiculed, I'm reproached. Can I serve God? Of course. You're serving. Friends or fools. Problems or progress. Serving God. Challenges and difficulties. Through it all, serving the Lord. The children are difficult and wayward, serving the Lord. My husband is not making life easy, still serving the Lord. My wife is trying to discourage me, still serving the Lord. My place of work, they are putting pressure on me, still serving the Lord. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, yielded, submissive to the Lord completely, serving the Lord. With purpose of heart, with purity of intention, with entire consecration and dedication, serving the Lord. You cannot serve God and mammon. He wants the whole heart.
your old talent, your old possession, your whole will, serving him without reservation. Without holding anything back, serving the Lord. Saved, saved, born again. Yielded and surrender to the Lord. That's what the Lord wants. Real salvation that makes you to live an overcoming life. Overcoming sin. Being so strong in your conviction. Being firm in your dedication to the Lord. That it doesn't matter what other people do. What other people say. What other people comment. That your heart, your mind is so yielded and submissive to the Lord. That no matter what other people do. You made up your mind. You have taken your decision. Serving the Lord, you will serve the Lord. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God acceptably with pretense, with hypocrisy. You cannot serve God with superficiality. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind yielded to the Lord. Circumstances may change, still serving the Lord. Situations may change, still serving the Lord. The weather may change, still serving the Lord. Your friends may change, still serving the Lord. Some people you are leaning upon, they may change, they change their attitude. They change their response to you. They change their attitude to you. They change their relationship to you. But you keep on serving the Lord. Whether that man is there or not, you keep on serving the Lord. That woman is there or not, you keep on serving the Lord. And that's how to serve the Lord. Holding on to him. Loving him. Cleaving to him. Yielded to him. At all times. In all conditions of life, serve the Lord. Serve Him. Serve Him. Make up your mind. You can bring your wife along to serve the Lord. That's glorious. Can bring your children along to serve the Lord with you. That's wonderful. But don't allow the decisions of other people to hinder your serving the Lord. Whatever others decide to do, that's their decision. No matter how close they are to you, that's their decision. You want to serve the Lord. You want to get to heaven. Make up your mind. That's it. Serve the Lord. Don't look back. Don't allow anything anyone to discourage you just move on serve the lord remember no man can serve two masters and you cannot serve god and mammon make your choice i will serve the lord